actually close the <laughs> other screen now. Okay. Um, yeah, and I can share my screen. So just for people listening in on the session, so um, we had, let me share my screen. We had talked about an issue that's a longstanding issue in Plenty um, about backticks. So um, this is a, this was open all the way back in January, 2021. Um, and it talks a little bit about how, if you try to use backticks in your code like this, it will blow up. Um, other people have noticed this as well. Um, and then uh, Rob, who uh, Roberto, who's done some great work with Plenty Theming, uh, is encountering this. And then I, I flagged you, Jesse, because we've been hitting this in some of our CMS work. Um, yep. And then I, I have a little discussion down here about what's happening um, and you know some of the challenges. And I, I want to kind of maybe give a little overview, and then we can kind of hash out some potential ideas for um, ways to fix this. So uh, would it be helpful for me to kind of start with some of my thoughts, and then we can hop into some ideas that you have? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, um, so basically, uh, we're hitting the Svelte compiler directly. Um, and anyone who's you know coming at this and they're not too familiar with JavaScript, these are um, template template literals or template strings. They're basically you know you can do multi line strings like this with backticks, and you can also do this thing where you add replacement patterns like in this kind of syntax here. Like we have the dollar sign um, curly brackets name uh, variable replacement. And when you try to do things like this in Plenty, it blows up. Now uh, the reason this happens is we're hitting the Svelte compiler directly. So if you open up the Svelte docs you can see that this is how you actually interact with this felt compiler directly. Most people don't use this felt.compile function because they're using a bundler like rollup and then they're using some kind of uh, Svelte plugin to do some of this information. But if you wanted to hit this directly, this is how you actually take um, the input Svelte template and turn it into JavaScript that the browser reads. So you, you do something like this. You pass a source string, which is what the component is, and then you pass options uh, like these down below. You can determine if you're, um, you know, uh, uh, generating this for the DOM uh, or SSR um, for the server. Um, you can do things like pass ESM formatting and things like that, or you can choose like if you want your CSS to be included. So um, that's basically how you run the, the Svelte compiler directly. Now, since we're doing things a little strange in Plenty, um, we're actually hitting that compiler directly. We don't use any bundlers. We do all our, our own bundling. Um, and actually, we don't even bundle. We, we do this thing that's very similar to Snowpack, where we actually just change all the import paths so they're ESM ready and you can run them in the browser and we don't bundle anything. We just copy them over to your, your single page uh, application output. Um, so we hit that directly. Um, that's one of the things we're doing weird. The other thing that we're doing really weird is we're actually running this in um, Go itself. So uh, we're pulling in the V8 project um, and then we're, we're using that to interpret the JavaScript. And then we're uh, doing that process all in V8 and through a Go API. Um, and then we're using that to actually compile the component. So that's where I think the problem basically gets introduced here. So this is kind of what it looks like when we run in V8. So we get a context in V8, and that gives us uh, an API to actually run JavaScripts. And then in here, what we do is we pass a string to actually hit the Svelte compiler. So this is all happening in this kind of um, uh, virtual environment uh, to interpret JavaScript, right? So we're running this as a whole string here, this um, compiling Svelte. And we're, we're saying that we want to get the JS and this, the CS output over here. We're, we're destructuring that. And then we're passing a couple options here. We're saying that we don't want the CSS because we're basically um, going to get that and all put it into one giant file instead of giving it on a component by component basis. We're saying that we want it to be hydratable because we basically hydrate um, our HTML fallbacks to, to have the interactivity on the front end. Um, and then this is just like a, a V8 Go convention to, to basically say, um, we want to run this as a continuous strip, script because we're going to be doing other things to this um, context here as well. Um, so the challenge here, I believe, and this took me a little while to wrap my head around, and maybe I'm still confused on it. It seems like a really simple challenge, but when I actually come down to it, it becomes really confusing. So the idea here is we have a component string, which is basically we read the file output um, from a specific component. So for instance, you know, in layout, you have a layouts folder in a Plenty project, and you have layouts global HTML.svel. And that's like kind of the wrapper for most of your project, right? So you'd pass you know, that whole contents as a component string and all its child um, components. And then you need to be able to compile that through the Svelte compiler, which, you know, normally you would pass that as a string to the Svelte compiler and they can compile it. And that string could contain, um, you know, template literals itself. The problem that I'm having is we need to let this know that we're passing it a string. And then we need to do this compilation as a string itself. So that's where it gets kind of challenging. So the way that I let this compiler, which is only a string representation, know that it's a string, is by passing template literals around the variable that we're passing in there. And so when you do that, you get into problems about nesting template literals. And that's where I'm having some, some trouble. So um, 
you can nest template literals. Like that is a thing you can do. But um, when you do that, so you so if you want to nest template literals, and I thought I had an example here. Um, yeah, okay. So this is an example of how you can actually nest template literals, right? Like, so there's a, a surrounding template literal here, and then you have a, a child template literal within there, and you have to basically pass the replacement pattern syntax. And then you can pass even replacement patterns to, to this, um, this replacement string. Now, the challenge here is that this is valid JavaScript, but this is not valid um, Svelte component uh, compilation because think about it, this outside template string here is what's getting passed to the compiler. So it's it's actually just getting the awareness that's a string. And then it wants to compile what's in here, which might be like a variable declaration or something like that. And it looks at this and it says, I don't know I'm within a template string at this point. So I'm kind of confused what to do with this outer syntax. And it, it was kind of like throwing me for a little loop. It seems like it should be something that's really simple, um, but it's giving me a little bit of a challenge. So where I'm at today um, is I, I found a compromise. Uh, it's not a great compromise. So um, what I did is what I'm doing now is when I find um, these template strings within a component, when I'm reading that file, I basically just escape them with a, a backslash. Well, actually, I have to do double backslash to back, uh, escape my backslash. But I, I do an escape in Go. And then what that does is it allows Plenty to compile a string like this without blowing up. So if you have a template string, you should be able to do this now, and it should work. The problem is uh, it's no longer a valid template literal. So if you try to do something like this with a replacement pattern, it will not know what this replacement pattern is. And you'll get something like reference error, don't know what the variable that you're trying to use within your template literal is. So I think it's you know, it will solve this initial use case. So you will be able to do something like this. And actually, this is already in the newest version of Plenty. Um, you should be able to run this fetch right here because we're not doing replacement patterns. That should work. So if you come down here and you grab version uh, 051, that should work. Um, whoops. Uh, that should be okay. But you won't be able to do the replacement pattern. So that's where we are today. It's not great. And maybe I'm just being silly about this and I'm not fully understanding how we can do this. But it, it, I think it's more challenging than it appears on the surface because of the way we're running this in V8 Go and the way we're passing these strings. Uh, one last thing before I, I turn it over to discussion, Jesse. So um, there's this great tutorial over here um, by Li Hao, uh, which is, this is a great channel if, if you haven't found this before um, for all Svelte things, like talking about the Svelte compiler and how things work. This is such great content. Um, but basically this is uh, an example over here. You can see at like the 21 minutes, uh, 46 seconds. Um, of running the Svelte compiler directly in case you wanted to do that. So you can see we're using the Svelte compiler API and we're using the compile. And what uh, he's doing in this video is he's using um, uh, Node.js file system and he's using the read file sync, which I believe uh, gets a, a string or it might be a buffer. And he's passing that directly here, which seems like, why don't we just do that? And I think the problem is this whole, uh, this whole declaration that we're doing is a string itself. And I think that's where I get into the Kind of the nested string scenario that gets a little confusing for me, but but this is where the challenge came for me, and maybe I'm just missing something here. So um, with that, uh, I don't know, Jesse. Do you have any ideas? Does this make sense, or am I completely obscuring the problem here? Well, as I said, I have done string injection in code, and mm -hmm. the best way to do it is not to do it. <laughs> yeah. And okay. You because there's. As you have seen, there's a bunch of problems there. Like yes. how the outer, system, outer program in, in breaths, the inner program, and how it <laughs> inter, interprets the like inner program. Yeah, <laughs> it's, exactly. It's really, really complex. But um, V8 Go, my, I, I just uh, take, took a look. So V8 Go actually supports implementing uh, or declaring a function uh, templates. I thought, okay, do you do you have that up right now? Is that something you can share your screen so we can take a look at that? Yeah. Can you see it? Yes. So this uh, is function with go callback. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't actually... Sure, we're okay. looking at the, yeah. Maybe you can understand it better. Yeah, I was, I do you know, I briefly looked at this and I think there might be something here. Um, so, so yeah, like a, like using um, function templates. Yeah, so there, there probably is a way to do this with the V8 Go API. And I think you're right that that's the way to do it. But right now I'm kind of, I'm avoiding understanding the full API of V8 Go, right? And I'm just kind of yeah. hacking it by throwing the strings together, which, you know, like you said, there's there's multiple problems that can arise. We we've noticed the backticks, but there might be other things that are happening 
the way we're doing it, right? So having a a more advanced approach to actually using the API for this type of thing, I think you're right, is the right call. So the new function template function uh, takes isolate of uh, type and function callback. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the isolate type is. Can you? Do you know what it is? Do you know what? It's scary how little I know about how the um, underworkings are, but I I basically it's, it's context it's, or something. Probably. Yeah. So you 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 have to create a new isolate, which I I think of as and this could be completely wrong for people who are watching this. Please, please correct me in the comments. But <laughs> um, I think it's like the idea of setting up is kind of like a virtual environment, and maybe that's the wrong word for it. But you create an isolate, and then you can have a context for that that isolate. So. Um, that's basically how I, I do that once to set up the whole um, basic build process for V8. And then, um, yeah, and then I create a context for, I create two contexts, one for the um, the browser rendered Svelte compiler, the, the DOM Svelte compiler. And then I do another option with SSR for the HTML fallbacks, right? Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of like some of the setup there. I, I would love to, let me see here. I'm, um, I'm going to reach out here on V8 Go and take a look here. Or maybe we have to, define the function in the javascript in javascript and then somehow get it outside get the um the so the function would be like compiling the the compile call for a svelte yep and returning the compiled svelte uh, yes the, or not svelte but javascript file yeah i thought about it um Yep, and we would have to call it from Go. Yes. Yep. yep. No, I thought about that too. So we have like this idea of long running scripts, right? Like just that one call is not the script doesn't start or um, exit at that one call, right? Like this is a long. That's why we named it that thing. So we could potentially run something to get the string representation in JavaScript first, assign it as a variable, and then pass that variable through a string or something like that. That's that's another option I thought about. Again, I think both those things are probably good things to explore. Um, and they're things that I, uh, I I think, you know, I don't have a full understanding of at the moment, uh, but I, I would like to take a look at that because I, I think you're right. We're, we're going to keep re reaching limitations the way we're doing it here. Um, I've re I've talked to Roger, who's the author of V8 Go before. He's he, he's great. He's been really helpful um, in understanding some of this stuff. So maybe I can reach out to him and uh, see if he can help me through some of that. Um, yeah, I think short term, that that's probably the way to go. Uh, longer term, I would love if we had some more native capabilities in Go uh, for doing some of this compile stuff without having to rely on um, V8 because that uh, you've heard me talk about before, I think, but V8 has a lot of things like Cgo involved that make builds and all, all sorts of things difficult. So, um, but yeah, for now, I think this is what we're working with. This is kind of like the MVP of plenty still, even though it's been mm -hmm. a long time, uh, but uh, we're, I still think we're in the MVP stage. You know, we're breaking APIs and we're changing things and we're adding the functionality. So, um, for now, I think getting something working is better than getting it perfect. So I think you're right. This is probably the best approach there. And uh, uh, it's actually nice that you're reiterating this because it's something I've been thinking about. And I'm like, this is probably yeah. the way to go. But it's nice to hear someone <laughs> kind of thinking that that's, that's yeah. probably the right approach. It like, supports how you, the, way, the, way, the steps you have taken. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, no, that's great. Thank you for, because I think... Um, I let that thought kind of go out of my mind already. So, the, and, and now that you're reiterating, I'm like, you know what, that is the way to go. And it, having that clarity is really helpful. Um, cool. So, yeah, so I guess for next steps on that, I, I think probably I can do a little research into the API and I can maybe reach out to Roger, see if he can help at all with that. I'm um, understanding that, or I can put an issue in his queue. Um, yeah. yeah, that sounds good there. Do you have other thoughts or other things you want to hash out? Uh, well, for the context of the Pactic bug, uh, I yeah. don't. Uh, well, I, I did a Goog like googling stuff uh, just now, so there's some some way to get a string. V8 string represents rep, uh, my tongue uh, re <laughs> representation from uh, from the v, um, Go yeah. uh, type. Uh -huh. So it casts the or creates 
V8 string from Go string, basically. Oh, interesting. Are you looking at something specifically? Is it worth sharing or is it just? No, it's just some Stack Overflow. Oh, okay. So it's not really well explained. But sure. yeah, there's, I think there's possibilities to do it that way. Okay. Um, okay, that sounds good. Do you, do you want to do you, do you want to send me that link just so I can take a look at that? Mm. Or is it already gone? <laughs> it's it's here, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll send send you the link. It's actually it's calling JavaScript function from getting the function from the V8 script hmm. and okay. then calling it probably yeah it would work probably so okay. you, you just have to run run script to create the function and then get it from the local variables to yeah okay go, yep then call it with the string made from go string yeah that makes it so i've done that so that is kind of what we're doing so we are kind of doing that but not fixing this problem, right? Like that's what yeah. we're actually pulling. We're pulling the JavaScript code out of the V8 and we're putting that into Go again. And then Go is yeah. writing to the file system with that thing. It's a really, like, there's some really crazy, this doesn't even scratch the surface of some of the crazy stuff we're doing. Like it's both, um, I'm both like uh, kind of uh, like, ha like satisfied with the fact that we've figured out some crazy stuff to do. Like we're, <laughs> we're making component signatures in our V8 and then we're like, allowing you to use that at all different places. We're also pulling values out of it for like pagination and other crazy things, which is kind of <laughs> impressive, but it's also like scary and a little fragile in ways. So yeah. it's like, it's both like, oh, this is cool that we were able to figure this out, but also like, hmm, I wish this was better. You know what I mean? Yeah. And especially I, I think um, as you've been diving into plenty, like um, I'm fully aware of a lot of the, the things like, first of all, weird bugs, like template strings. Also um, the the error handling is just like, grotesque and that's something that we're gonna have to figure out at some point so to make a project sus sustainable to debug at a, at a high level right so there's a lot of things we need to do but right now the focus is um getting a working concept like kind of full package of working concept and then we'll figure out how to make it better faster um, more reliable um yep. but, yeah just to kind of talk about <laughs> my thought process behind some yeah. of this stuff <laughs> what's the, what's the uh, goal to make it fast actually the framework yes so that's what that was the differentiating factor factor. Yeah. So in, in the thing is um, my idea of fast is uh, uh -huh. different than a lot of people probably think. So right now I think a lot of people might be like, Hey, plenty is pretty for small projects. It blows up on bigger projects, but small projects, plenty is like very fast, but mm -hmm. it's not nearly as fast as I, I expect it and need it to be in the future because the whole idea mm -hmm. is with this get back CMS, you have this continuous process and it should feel yeah. like you're editing a WordPress site. Right. So at some point mm -hmm. you need, really fast CI builds and feedback in order for that whole thing to work and make sense. So I think um, the first model is going to be like, okay, it works and it's kind of usable, but maybe a little frustrating, but the future hopefully is like, okay, this actually makes sense. At least that's the yeah. vision I have for the long term. I don't know how far out we are from that, but. So there, I've actually made um, some some implementation for partial rent partial regeneration of content so so just one page of content will be regenerated or only one section of page will will be regenerated instead of doing like the whole thing In, instead of doing the whole site yeah that's In act that's typically the problem with blocking sites yes when In the there... block, block post count grows the uh, pull time grows Expert yeah really fast Yep. So there's a lot. Yeah. There's so much. I mean, there's so many things. Okay. So a couple of things I want to say in that is um, a developer who's helped with this project, Parik, uh, he actually implemented in plenty um, a in-memory build that did that as well. It only looked for the files mm -hmm. that have changes and recompile those. And it was yeah. mostly for local development. And I did recently break that. So I reconfigured the um, uh, what, what we call GoPack to get those ESM imports. I think you had actually flagged the issue that NPM was not working with most things. And I, I reconfigured that to work a little better. In that process, I broke the in-memory builds and I have not fixed it or put it back together. So that 
has broken in the recent versions, but um, previously we did have the ability to build in memory and only compile the uh, individual files that changes. Now yeah. that is super helpful for um, uh, local builds. It It's a little more difficult in CI because CI kind of like doesn't have any awareness of what was happening before, unless you're writing those things to the file system and having some kind of check there. So there's a lot that I'm, I'm back and forth. Like I think um, maybe that would be a future thing. I'm also kind of of the mindset that like having the builds be as simple and replicable on every environment is kind of an advantage just to keep the project simple for now while we're changing things very often. And then we can think about those optimizations later because yeah. um, I think my goal initially is like, okay, make the full start to finish build without any awareness of state as fast as absolutely possible. And then some of those problems kind of go away over time. And I think right now it's hard to envision because we're not even scratching the surface of that, right? Like we're doing this stuff in VA and it's like, it's fast, but it's like, on my computer, it's like less than a second. On slower computers, it's like two or three seconds, which is far too long. I'm thinking at some point it'll be like, you know, uh, micro seconds. It's gonna be like very, like super fast that you don't even think about that anymore. Um, but yeah, that, again, these are all long-term visions. I think we have to get to the point where we're compiling some things and go, and that's that's who who knows how far out that is. Um, yeah. Interestingly enough, I've been noticing other people kind of chatting about these kind of concepts. You know, the, the Svelte team itself is talking about maybe a Rust compiler in the future. I saw some other people posting about making uh, a spelt like Go compiler. And I'm like, I'm trying to get in touch with those people because I'm like, why don't we band together? They, they, want, they want to do it open source. So why don't we band together and support this project together? Even if we have individual projects, I don't yeah. necessarily care about that. But I see, I feel like there's an opportunity to share resources and learning. Um, but we'll see if that pulls together. It's, that's kind of long-term planning. Hmm. Yeah. Anyways, that's, that's a lot to... to discuss um yeah. other topics for today is anything else you want to go over um i don't think we have any other topics today cool i i cannot think of one currently yeah yeah i i feel good um this is helpful this was actually really helpful thank you for prompting me to to take another look at this but have you thought of um there, there has been like talk about in general like JS framework community, uh, like um, islands of islands of um, interactivity, like like um, partial hydration, partial, partial hydration, for example. Yeah. yeah, I was, I mean, thinking about it in terms of so there. Depends on what level of thinking you're talking about. Like, how, yeah. like this comes up in my mind all the time. Have I dug in and understood it and how to implement it? No, but it's been something I, I think about a lot. Like, I'm, I know there's other projects even in the Svelte ecosystem that are doing this and thinking about this. Mm -hmm. And it, pro I mean, from a, an efficiency standpoint, from the builds, you can save tons of time, right? Um, and I wonder, and I think also like from how much JavaScript is limited to the browser. For, for the browser. Exactly, you can save a bunch of time there yeah. as well. So, like, is this something we should probably be doing? Yes. How does that interact? with how we set up the templates and the fallbacks and reloading the, the Svelte right now? I don't know. And that's, you know, that can change, but also how does that interact with the CMS, right? That's another question. So at the end of the day, like, you know, we want to be able to log in and edit every page and have those pages interactive. And can you do that in a meaningful way without fully hydrating the site to a single page app? Maybe. And, and you, yeah. you probably, yeah, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Does that seem like? Yeah. Well, uh, the, you don't have to make hydrate the whole page yeah. and recreate the HTML elements and so on. Yeah. Or not recreate them, but make the virtual DOM or whatever you do. Yeah. Auto representation of the DOM. Um, yeah. You can have a global state and then uh, like multiple apps in the page. Yeah, that's somehow communicating through the global stage, the uh, global state. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. What I have think of. I have think of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that's the right thought process because right now, most okay, so most pages are like static, right? And there's some interactivity, yeah. and making every one of those components interactive yeah. is a waste of resources, right? So I, I totally it agree is. with that. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things. It's like I'm 
thinking through this, like, okay, plenty, like the way we do content and bundle everything together, like, I'm not sure that's the long-term way we're going to do all these things anyways. So mm-hmm. yeah, there's so many questions like this. And I think it's great that we're talking about them and, and thinking about how to implement them. Uh, it's a, just a work in progress. Hopefully we'll make this stuff better as we go. Um, the problem I had when I, and when I was doing the partial hydration testing for my own project, yeah. I, I, how to indicate that the component wants that you want to hydrate the component and use it in the client side. Yeah. And I guess also I, I solved it using a um, co- comment on top of the first line, line of script was comment that oh. said, it, should, should it be hydrated and how it should be hydrated? Oh, and, interesting. And I parsed it using a roll up. Oh, okay. That's pretty interesting. So, so it's pretty deterministic then like you, you, you say when something should be hydrated or not, right? Is that basically yeah. how you're doing it? Yeah. Okay. It what would, are your thoughts on, in, is it, it, it would uh, inject the state, the server render state for the component to the HTML and then load, load it back to the JavaScript when, when it, it was loading. Yeah. And when you're saying state, are we talking about like Svelte stores or how are you? Um, well, the component properties and props and so on okay. can be component state or mm-hmm. global state can be Svelte stores and gotcha. objects and gotcha. something like that. Yeah. And I was wondering in this, I don't know, again, this is me not having looked into partial hydration enough. Is there like, is there an intelligent way for the project or the compilation step to figure out if something is going to be interactive or not. So for instance, like, okay, mm-hmm. right now we hydrate an H1 that, that has no interactivity. Like you can't click on, you can't change it. It's an H1, it's just static HTML. And then mm-hmm. maybe there is a button that changes the button text when you click on it, right? So that's something that's interactive. Is mm-hmm. there a way for Svelte to know, it's like, hey, I don't need to hydrate the H1 because I'm not applying interactivity to this. I do need to hydrate the button because I'm doing something to it. Is, is there yeah. a way for it to know that? I think they are, there are because uh, interactivity, there's a source for interactivity. That's mm-hmm. the event that the user creates. Yeah. So if you find, find events, then you are creating a basically an interactive component. That's or, like the on directive, right? right? Like or, on click, on hover yeah, or whatever. Yeah. 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 Okay. Or you could do the event binding in two ways. You could either have the on, on click and on hover. Uh, yeah attributes in Svelte uh, elements, or then you could have a reference to the element and then call it in the script tag with yeah. an add event listener or something like that. So if yeah. you have event listeners in or references in a template, then it should be marked as interactive component. Yeah, exactly. And that, that kind of gets to, the, yeah, exactly. So there's the reactive components, right, too. So like not only something with an event listener, but a, a reactive component would also have to know to be hydrated, right? So say you have a button, just for, I think you understand this, but for people listening, it's like, okay, you have a button that has an event listener. You know that has to be hydrated, but maybe that button influences the value that's in an H1, right? Yeah. So now it's like that doesn't have an event listener, but it's a reactive component that the text changes based on an interactivity. So somehow it has to also know about that reactivity. Um, And yeah. obviously... Svelte knows about that through the label syntax, right? To know that it's a reactive component that depends on another value. And maybe it's as simple as that because I know on the comp- compilation step, those label statements, they inter- they um, feed into the compiled API JavaScript. Like it, it tells it that that's a reactive yeah. statement. So it might be able to just pick up on it that way. But then again, this is this is a research project for, for us at some point to figure out yeah. exactly what that looks like. Um, it would yeah. be sweet to do it. Do it. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, there's so many, my vision for this and hopefully the project that's, you know, is a sustainable enough to to endure long-term planning. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like, you know, get it, we're like building this thing and getting it working, getting it just like a, like fully working in its own like slow buggy state. And it's like, okay, once we've proven that this works and it makes sense and it's cool, then it's like, okay, how do we partial hydrate? How do we fix the build? How we do all these things, better error handling, all that stuff. In my mind, I worry um, you could you could approach the project two ways, right? It's like every brick is right before you get to another brick. And sometimes I think maybe that's a good way to do it. But I feel like 
almost like the excitement around the project is like a finite resource. And I don't okay. want to lose steam on the excitement because we're making these, the foundation so perfect that we never get to the walls or the ceiling. Yeah. I, you know, I want to get like the roof on, I want to get a thing. And then it's like, yeah. now let's put some steel beams in there and like reinforce it. So I'm trying to capture as much of my own excitement as possible to, to make it mm. sustainable. And then we'll th think about making it better. But, um, and I don't mean to, to say like, don't, let's not have these conversations. I, I love these conversations. Like these are the, the type of things that I want to be spinning up on all the time. So. Yeah. My storming and like thinking of new ideas, but yeah, but actually implementing them until there's time, time, like there's proper time to it. Yeah. And also I've been finding in my own experience that, um, the brainstorming takes months of time and I mull it over and I consider like, I'll be in the shower. I'll consider different opportunities. Like, Oh, there's a drawback there. And that, and the implementation takes like five minutes. Like it doesn't take that long. Like, I mean, not all the time, but like in a lot of cases, like I've mulled over decisions like, Hmm, what should it really look like when I'm doing base URLs? Right? Like I, I thought about that for a while and I don't even know if I got that one right. And I might have it wrong, but like I took a long time to, to think over like, what should that look like when I'm developing it? Like what is intuitive to a programmer? What is out of their way so they have some control, but also helpful so they're not doing a bunch of things from scratch. And I, I, I molded over for a while. Um, actually implementation of that took me a little bit of time, but like the thought process for these things takes forever. So I think starting to mold these things over like, okay, what is partial hydration? Hmm, how does it work? How would it influence our project? How can we implement? Like that's gonna be most of the work. And then eventually after months of like hashing out ideas, we'll be like, okay, let's write the 10 lines of code or whatever it is that like actually does this. Um, mm. So this, at least that's my experience of how, like how to figure a lot of this stuff out. You just like, you think about yeah. it a lot and you talk about it for a while. Yeah, maybe that's how you get to the better, better solutions. But yeah, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that iterates a lot. <laughs> I, and honestly, maybe I, I, there's, there's probably a balance between doing those things. Yeah. I don't know what, when to do either, but um, yeah, it, it's hard to figure out exactly the right path sometimes. Yeah, but yeah. So you have done, done something correct because I, I cannot get a project, project to the stage that it can be used because I'm iterating it all the time at <laughs> the base code. I, I do that myself and sometimes I can't tell how helpful or harmful it is. So even this, this project itself, like plenty, I redid the build process like five times and I'm honestly not sure I'm so, okay. It started like we called out to Node.js through uh, an exec command through, through go. And then I did some other things as pat, like I encoded all the strings and I passed them as one thing. I, and then I, I would, I would encode each component individually and hit the compiler each time. And I've done all these things. Now I'm in V8 because um, early on I posted to Reddit this problem. Like how do I make this process self-contained and better? And someone suggested V8 and I'm not sure a hundred percent that I made the right call there. Now looking back at it in hindsight, this is where we are and it's working and it's good enough for now and we're moving forward. But like, I'm not sure that I made the right call there. I had some other thoughts about maybe using like, um, uh, you know, there's, 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 um, ways to actually bundle up node projects into their, their own binaries. And then I could embed those binaries in our binary. It's getting kind of crazy, but like, I sometimes wonder if that would have been a better way to go. Um, and there's all these thoughts and it, it's hard to know if you're doing the right thing. And I, I was at the stage where I just kept rebuilding the same thing and I wasn't getting anywhere. And so I just cut it at some point and moved on to the next step. Um, but yeah, I, I struggle with that too. It's like, how many times do you rebuild it? Like, you know, yeah. do you want to, do you want to build on a, a shaky foundation? I don't know. Like I, at some point you have to get some steam on it. Um, I also, I also think about these things. Like I think open source projects, they're not thought of in terms of like marketing. And I, I from a very early standpoint, I wanted to like learn in public, speak at conferences and kind of get the idea out there. Um, sometimes I think I, I let my vision get carried away and, and people thought the project was farther along than it was. And I, I kind of regret that because I, I feel like I, I didn't never want to purposely mislead anyone, but like, it's hard to navigate your vision versus what what's there. And yeah. so it's, it's hard to find that balance because you want, you want to share why you're doing it so people can get excited and get involved. Mm. You also want to be realistic where you are and how long it's going to take to get where you're, you're going. Um, so yeah, I'm learning this stuff as I go. It's, um, it's interesting. I, it, it's fun. Yeah. Everything is a balance. Yeah. Everything's a balance for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's been fun. It, um, I'm, I'm excited. I still feel excited about the project, which is good. Um, yeah, yeah, it's part of the battle. But it is. <laughs> yeah.
Cool. Well, this is great. This could turn into like a philosophical conversation <laughs> about open source project. That's awesome. Oh, I like that. Um, yeah, I'll I'll give you the rest of your day back, Jesse. I'll kill the recording and then uh, yeah. Th thanks for the call. Thank you.